to have quite a few people who have already come on, including our guest, Sharon. And um, so I'm going to ask that if you are speaking, you would turn on your screen as a way to be recognized, acknowledged. And if you are just in the listening mode, you would uh, turn your screen off. Uh, that is unless someone is on phone. Is there someone who is not able to turn on their screen because they're on phone? Okay. Terrific. Did everyone uh, receive the minutes and the agenda for today? Uh, not hearing that no one did not, I'm going to proceed with that. And we'll open the meeting at this point. For the benefit of the uh, recording and the CART reporter, I'm just going to list who are, who are on screen. I am Nancy McGuire Heath. Uh, Ernest Covington III is here, Joan Watman, Rain Dipucat. We have our captioner, Jen Pyers, Leela Foley, Paul Hewitt, Pamela Zellner, Tim Riker, Lucy Cruz, and Sharon Applegate. Interpreter. The interpreters missed one name. Um, J, uh, P H H, I think is the name. Paul Hewitt. Thank you. Okay. I'm just going to pull up the agenda so that we can proceed in the order that it was sent out. If you'll give me one minute. And I cannot get it to come up, so you're going to have to all help me out today. Um, uh, first, it, we have public comments. And um, let's see if there's anyone here who wishes to address us. You would turn on your screen. We'd be happy to hear from you. Okay, bearing that there seems to be no public comments, um, we'll go on to the minutes. The minutes were sent to you, um, and um, I'm just curious if there's any corrections or edits or additions. Give you a minute to look over them. So Tim is saying, I think everything was in the minutes, but it's very difficult to encapsulate everything that we had a discussion about. It was difficult, yes. You know, we talked about the schools for the deaf and um, basically the minutes pretty much, they're satisfactory for sure as, as a report. <laughs> uh, as you know, um, I am now chairing the meeting since there was no uh, no one willing to step up, but I cannot do all of that. So one of the things we will discuss today is um, who might like to help us out by taking minutes. Uh, 
Um, I did ask you to think about that this last over this last time. We haven't met for quite some time. And before we get on with our agenda, I wonder if there's anyone who feels they'd like to take it on or even share it with someone else. We have no takers. Jeannie's saying, I'm sorry, I'm showing up, but I'll just say hi. <laughs> hi, Jeannie, you don't want to be our note taker? <laughs> All right, well, we'll need to um, determine this before the meeting ends today. Someone needs to be taking minutes today, and I, I really am not willing to do it all. So um, we do need some help here. All right, we will uh, move on and um, um, go on to old business. Our old business is that we are very eager to hear from our speaker, but I wanted to have a moment to ask our executive director to give a quick report. Um, Ernest, if you would come on. Oh, Bethany has something to say. Um, I can take um, notes off of the um, the the transcript. That's very helpful, thank you. So Bethany has agreed to take notes this time off of the transcript, thank you so much. All right, let's go and see if Ernest has some updating to do for us, what's going on at the commission. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you very much, Nancy, uh, for letting me give a quick report. So I don't have anything uh, that I'd like to present or uh, get into today. Sharon. But I, want, I am looking forward to Sharon giving a presentation. Uh, Sharon is from Deaf Inc. And I really have nothing in particular that I feel needs to be shared at this time. I really would like to uh, you know, I'm really putting all of my focus into the COVID vaccine um, and trying to uh, resolve some of the issues in terms of inclusion for everyone, get everyone included that needs to get it, get access, you know, people that need access to it. Um, you know, people with disabilities are not necessarily getting that access. Um, within phase one, interpreters are not being included within phase one. So, Really, the main focus right now is trying to make sure that interpreters and also people with disabilities who work in different settings, whether it's group homes, mental health, et cetera, are able to get the vaccine. Um, it's really a hot issue right now. It's, we're really making a big push. We want to make sure that people with disabilities and interpreters are not ignored or put you know, at a lower priority. So that's really a big challenge. So I just, I'll share that that's really where a lot of my focus is going right now. Um, thank you, Nancy, and I look forward to uh, hearing from the guest speaker. All righty. Um, I was intending to welcome our new member, Mr. Carlin Danner, but he doesn't seem to be on. So we're going to go ahead and um, let me summarize the purpose of today's meeting and why we were delighted to um, hear that Sharon was going to join us. I'm going to put my camera on. You'll have to forgive me, today was a particularly stressful day here at school, so I am uh, I raced to this meeting without much chance to take a breath. Um, in our education subcommittee, we have been discussing um, the challenges that we face here in Rhode Island, um, all generational challenges related to education. And we were able to identify some um, critical areas, one of which was that there was no um, resource agency that could provide education for deaf adults um, once they left the K through 12 system. And that there, um, that was a real gaping hole in services in Rhode Island. As we began to talk about it, many of us are big fans of Deaf Inc. 
and um, and we it dawned on us that it would be very helpful for us to see if something similar could be set up in Rhode Island for our deaf um, citizens. And, um, and we we're grateful that Sharon, who has lots of experience uh, at Deaf Inc, was willing to come and talk with us. And I promised her that it would be informal, that she could share with us the history of Deaf Inc and how it got founded. And then we would open it up for some Q&A as we try to determine how something similar might be funded and established in Rhode Island. And, um, and so it is really a pleasure for me to um, welcome Sharon Applegate. And I'm thrilled, Sharon, that you were willing to come and chat with us at the very beginning of our journey to try to see if we can deepen services for our um, folks who are deaf and hard of hearing here in Rhode Island. And so without further ado, that's why we're here. And I am excited to hear your journey and how you came to do this and how the agency came to be established. So thank you for inviting me to this meeting. I appreciate it. Um, it's been a while. I haven't seen Nancy and some other faces that are familiar to me. I am obviously Sharon Applegate. And I'm the executive director at Deaf Incorporated. The headquarters are up in Boston. Nancy had spoken to me and said that Rhode Island had been thinking about what the services were that the deaf community needed and that there should be something similar to Deaf Inc. And so she asked me to come to this meeting and explain to you how Deaf Inc. operated, how, how we got set up and what's been happening from then till now. And I was glad to share that. I was a former board member well, actually, I was the board member that was there when Deaf Incorporated, um, you know, started and nobody else was available. So I thought that would be a good thing. But I just wanted to clarify if there's anything that people need expanded, please interrupt me. You don't have to save all your questions to the end. But I just wanted to one, I wanted to ask Nancy, how much time do we have? How much time do you have? Because... There are items on the agenda maybe after me and I just, I wanna make sure and be respectful of the time. Um, Sharon, uh, you are our primary agenda today. Let me turn on my camera. Hello, uh, you are our primary agenda item. We are very excited to have you here. Uh, our meeting usually wraps up around 5.30. Okay, very good. Thank you so much for clarifying, that's great. So Deaf Inc, the name itself, the legal name, D-E-A-F, it's a little odd. It's developmental evaluation and adjustment facility incorporated. So the initials D-E-A-F is an acronym. Back in 1977, at that time, 76, 77, the community was really crying out for work, deaf and hard of hearing people. Employment was a huge issue. So at that point, the Mass State Association of the Deaf was involved. The Mass Commission, wait a minute, 19, no, it was called Mass Rehab Commission. The Mass Office of Deafness, that's the old name prior to have Mass Commission for the Deaf and Hard of Hearing back in the 80s, and the National Association of the Deaf, the NAD. Also, there were leaders from the deaf community within Massachusetts who came together and started to discuss this. Like you're thinking about it tonight. That's a great example of the kind of thing that happened back in the 70s. And we recognized that there was a huge need for employment. Mass Rehab Commission, the MRC is the VR. They get funded and they were able to put some money into our incorporation with another uh, donor. 
So that started in 1977 in Boston. We're in the exact same building that we were in then. We haven't moved around. <laughs> We've stayed in that one town. It's in Alston. The focus at the point when we incorporated was jobs. That's why that form, that DEAF, Development, Employment, Adjustment Facility. But then people just started calling it DEAF Inc. DEAF stopped being even thought of as an acronym, DEAF Inc. And we started to hire people and bring people in for the board members. We got an executive director. We had some staff back in the 70s, maybe four or five, six staff. And we really focused on employment and evaluation of skills to make sure that people, you know, we had job coaches and placement for employment and all of that. And as time went on, we realized there were some struggles and some challenges that we were, you know, having a difficulty when people found jobs or keeping jobs. And what we realized is that people had other needs. They did, they were food scarcity. They needed support around getting food. They were homeless. There were other issues that happened within our lives that affected our ability to get jobs and hold a job. So th that was when we basically started a new program and the Mass Commission for the Hard of Hearing started funding us, and that was Independent Living Skills, the Independent Living Center. Prior to that, somebody could be like considered job ready, but you had to really think about your own skills. Did you have food, family support, transportation, housing? You need those things in order to be able to really achieve at a job. So we started the independent living originally in Boston. And at that point, we were the only organization in 70, 77 to 80. We were really the only ones in Massachusetts providing that kind of service. Oh, I forgot something important. I wanted to mention some of the research. When I talked about all the people who were involved, Mass Rehab Commission, all the different organizations, we also had the New York University rehab program that was part of the rehab act it was dr dr john shine he was um a doctor i'm trying to think if there was somebody else that you might be familiar with um I don't remember the name, but there were two people involved who had done research and had evidence about what we were talking about, about deaf people being underemployed or unemployed. I say I got spotlighted. <laughs> okay. All right. You can see me clearly. The screen has changed, but we're all set. Okay, good. Oh, where was I? Sorry, I got thrown for a moment when the screen changed. Okay, so the research that they had about the needs of deaf people, what kinds of services we needed. So that obviously was involved in our original incorporation. I wanted to backtrack to mention that. So now we're back to when we started talking about the independent living. I'll talk about the organization itself and then other areas. So independent living services really grew. Deaf people flocked to it. And people were really taking advantage of it. We realized that there was a need in other areas of Massachusetts, not just Boston. We actually have five offices now where we provide independent living services in the Eastern Mass. We set up the Boston one first, and then we had a North Shore one, and then a South Shore. And that also was Cape Cod. So we were covering the whole Eastern seaboard there of Massachusetts. And the number of people grew, they all needed services. For example, the kinds of services we would offer, reading mail. People, deaf people sometimes are challenged when something arrives at the home and they can't understand the letter. Social security will write them. Um, there'll be some other information that's important and they bring it to our office. We help them to advocate for themselves as well. 
because if they get something about food stamps or they get something um, about a medical appointment, it could be anything that's written. They need to be able to, to get what they need. There's a lot of non-deaf associations out there who do not ha know how to communicate with deaf people. And a lot of those people were referring their clients to us. So we started with the independent living. And then we realized the deaf blind community started to speak up for their own needs. They needed services. So we created the Deaf Blind Interpreter Alliance. That was back in 2000, I think. We recognized the need and we supported deaf blind people. And Deaf Inc. was involved as part of that as well. We did advocacy at the State House. The Mass Commission for the Blind was involved, MCB. And we needed, you know, the community to be involved. The same as the Independent Living Center started with a lot of community involvement. The deaf blind um, component started because we got more money. We started to be able to create programs. We had leaders in the deaf community involved. We had people who were deaf blind. And then we started the deaf blind uh, contact access network. That was DBCAN is what we call it. And it actually grew to a statewide service in 2001. What we do is we train people who are interested in becoming what we call DBCAN providers. And the providers learn how to guide a deafblind person appropriately, not grabbing their arm, but being able to let lead them by having the deafblind person, um, you know, grab onto them for guidance. We teach them that. We also give them all this information about how to communicate with deafblind people. And then they enter the community and it gives access, let's say, to church or going to exercise at the YMCA or going food shopping or visiting family. Something to get deafblind people out of the home and to show that they were very often isolated and very depressed because they were at home. And now they had more self-esteem. They were out, social. And a lot of them became our leaders. They got jobs. A lot of successes happened because of it. They enjoyed their lives more. So that service was very important. So the independent living has continued to, to this day. And so has DBCAM. And it's strong. It's a, it's a great service. Then another core program that got created that really helped support the agency we have an ASL program, American Sign Language. And what's happened is with American Sign Language, it's not really a program. We offer classes. But over the years, we were offering these independent individual classes. And two years ago, we created the program. And what's what it does is there's unrestricted funding. So a student would play for a class and we get that kind of money from the tuition, let's say. And there might be things that the consumers need, like the Mass Commission for the Deaf and Hard of Hearing funds is earmarked to independent living. We can't use it for other generate um, operations or other kinds of uh, overhead. And the ASL program though is unrestricted, excuse me, the interpreter wants to correct, unrestricted funds so that we can use it to support other things. And when it becomes its own, program funding, you know, let's say it pays for itself, then that money could be used for other services that we need. That's our goal. So we're hoping to develop that. We want to be able to get money from the state, the city, from private organizations, fundraising, and from the ASL classes. And this provides us one way. The ASL program has expanded like crazy. And even with COVID, we can't meet in person, but we pivoted and became a remote teaching organization, which is great. I mean, local people used to be able to come, you know, but you could even have people from out of state and internationally now because we're meeting on Zoom. That's great. So those are the three core programs to describe within Deaf Inc., just to give you the basic. And then the board, the, 
the board is extremely important. And I want to talk more about the board makeup and about the staff and about funding. But before I go into that, I wanted to stop and ask for questions about the program and services that I've already described. Any questions about those things? Yes, Nancy. Uh, you're muted. Okay. I have referred people to you for parenting classes, for citizenship classes through the years, um, for voter registration drives. Um, I know currently you're offering a workshop for people who are diabetic. Um, you have done so many amazing things. Does that all fall under independent living? Is that what, the, what you would place that under? So I would say yes, under independent living, but it's not just, it could be A to Z. <laughs> so yes, deaf health is part of that. We have a lot of workshops, like you're talking about diabetes, for sure. And also um, we provide, we partner with other groups. Um, to have like AARP, the Association of uh, Re Retired People and um, other coalitions that work, you know, we're not only, um, you know, working in isolation, we're working with other organizations that also serve different populations and it really makes it work for us. Also, parenting support groups. That's funded by the department, let me think. Oh, Children and Families, DCF. We get partial funding from that. And what might happen is very often it's deaf parents who have children who can hear. And we do parent training about disciplining children appropriately. Um, we have different ideas about activities that you can do with the children, like bring them to a museum we show the parents different ways of enjoying themselves and having fun with the children. So that's a, that's a good part of the program too. So independent living is the largest program that we run because the most needs exist there. We have, I would say independent living services for the you know, coastal cities that we have. We have a budget of $1.2 million and the Mass Commission for the Deaf and Hard of Hearing has a contract with Deaf Incorporated and also two other organizations, one in Central Mass, the Center for Living and Working, CLW. They do a cross-disability independent living where they have people who are not deaf but have other disabilities in with the deaf people as well. And then there's another one further west called Viability. And they're in um, the um, Pioneer Valley and Berkshires. So the state does provide those services through contract and statewide through those three different agencies. And the demand for that, oh my gosh, we serve, I'd say a thousand, a thousand two hundred people annually, just providing independent living services. Yeah. Are there any other questions related to the programs and the services? Hi, hi, Sharon. I haven't seen you for a long time. Um, I would like to ask about, so, so speaking about in Rhode Island, there's particular areas where there are many refugees, um, Im immigrants uh, living in, for example, the Providence area, uh, probably similar to Northeast uh, in Massachusetts. Um, so I'm wondering about what kind of funding Deaf Inc. receives for that uh, type of work in supporting refugees um, and immigrants, Deaf immigrants, and those types of needs that, that those populations would, uh, would need support in. Very good. Thanks for asking that. Yes, that's great. So yes, we do have several um, things about refugees and immigrants coming in for sure to get services. Basically, they I mean, they need basic English, how to fill out 
applications and other forms, how to open a bank account, all of those different things, how, then how to become a citizenship, how to become a citizen. Those are all listed under the deaf, hard of, deaf, the Commission for the Deaf and Hard of Hearing Independent Living Programs. That's part of the contract. And basic, basic sign language classes. So we have English and sign language that people need. What, what happens is if their signing improves, we then put them over to the ASL program. A lot of times we'll have a hard of hearing person who wants to learn sign language or a deaf person who's moving from a country that doesn't know American sign language. And then they're in our ASL classes. That's a fee to go to class. But for the Mass Rehab Commission will fund the basics and then they can go into ASL classes and the ASL classes can help lead to uh, jobs. So MRC will fund those basic classes, not the ASL, um, the ASL program. But prior to- the, just, uh, just to clarify, just to clarify, M MRC will fund uh, a deaf person going from the basic classes um, to the ASL class because the ASL class has a fee associated with it as we discussed. So MRC will pay for a deaf person to attend the regular ASL class once they're ready. Great. So Tim, did I answer your question? You did, thank you. And um, that was one question that I had. I have, of course, many questions that I could ask well, I'm you. I'm ready for more. <laughs> um, so another question would be that Rhode Island right now has some different services that are that do exist. For example, Tri-County Action, uh, I'm forgetting the rest of the name, Tri-County Action. Uh, that's an agency that uh, advocates for victims of crime. Um, and there are two deaf folks that, that work there. There's also Bridgemark uh, that supports uh, deaf people who are in uh, recovery, um, substance recovery. And it seems like there's some missing pieces in regards to advocacy. So self-advocacy, of course, is part of that. Um, but also who is doing kind of general advocacy? So we have some of these services that I mentioned, but what if, what if a deaf person needs to navigate a system um, or needs you know, uh, someone to kind of help them through a process that they haven't done before, um, whether it's systemic, or individual people, individual advocacy or systemic advocacy. Um, that's something it seems like we're missing. So in Massachusetts, we have the State Association of the Deaf, MSAD. And they're a good advocacy group at the state level. For example, when we had the grassroots, we um, the uh, grassroots deaf campaign, I can't think of the word for it, uh, It was a grassroots organization that uh, protested at the state house about services. And there were a lot of deaf people who spoke up and said that they needed substance abuse services. There are services from AA and NA, but they're not accessible to deaf people. So they wrote letters, they advocated, they went to the state's representatives and the state heard them and has set up funding. So the Mass Commission for the Deaf and Hard of Hearing has set up some programs. This recently has come to us too with two other state agencies that we work with that, that do, that do live in, independent living services for the deaf that I mentioned before. And we have been working on a substance abuse we call it SA, users screening. We screen people. I mean, hearing people can go anywhere and they're screening for them, non-deaf people. But we have to identify people who are at risk of using or need treatment. And then once we've screened them, we refer them. But then the challenge is where can they get those services? we would need to be able to set up something first to show that 
there is an issue, there's a lack of services. So we're doing a lot of just demographics, just collecting the information. And it gets back to the community. People need to lobby at the state house. They need to self-advocate. Another one that has happened, I mean, annually, we have gone to the state house to talk about the budget, to give feedback to them so that we get more funding. For example, the deaf blind community is very strongly coordinated. They're very successful and they're very powerful in getting lobbying for the information that they need. There might be 10 or 15 deaf blind people who go in a group to the state house. And I don't know if you could imagine a legislator sitting there and suddenly seeing a group of people doing tactile signing and all of that. It really is striking. And I think that when you hear from people tell their own story, their real life story and talk about what their needs are, it definitely again comes from the community. If we can get the community to go up to the state house and get together, it really makes an impact. So I don't know, I mean, Rhode Island has a state association here because that would be a good start. And let me think. I mean, Tim, I know you have several questions, but does that answer that question? It does, yes, thank you for those comments. I think also um, there are, you know, individuals experiencing job discrimination, um, hospitals not providing interpreters or meeting their, you know, communication needs. It's almost like these little things, we have the laws, we have the systems, but individuals navigating through these situations, how to file a complaint. What if, what if they do get an interpreter, but the interpreter is not behaving in an ethical way uh, or not qualified to provide that service? Things like that. Those are things that uh, I think that we see in Rhode Island, uh, how to go about doing those things and how to get some support in, in advocating uh, in those situations. Yes. And that again, falls under independent legal services. Some of the staff might be skilled in a specific area, like for immigration. You could possibly get some specific training and know, you know who the contact people are in different locations that you could work with. Educational opportunities, you could explain access for that. How to get interpreters. So we educate people, we work with the consumers so that they learn how to advocate for themselves. And we support them through that. And a lot of times it has to be repeated. Like a consumer might say, the doctor won't provide an interpreter. And we would maybe attend with them or go to the doctors, contact the doctors and advocate for that. Sometimes we have the Boston Legal Services and it's supposed to be free legal services to file a complaint, but they have to do it through the internet. And some of our consumers, the, some of the staff have a lot of resources. They know a lot, they've worked for years, they know all the players in the area and they know how to get through all of this. And we also have weekly meetings where a lot of that information is shared among the staff. So now that IL Services has been around for 30 years, for well, almost 40 years, the specialists that work in our agency have built a lot of the skills and this base of knowledge. They, they have learned a lot through their own experience. Some of the staff have been around for a long time and they know what's out there. They're familiar with it and they, they can, you know, they can really move through the system for our, for our consumers. Other questions? This is Ernest. He's saying, I'm Ernest Covington III. And I'm the executive director of the Rhode Island Commission for the Deaf and the Hard of Hearing. Your program, it sounds like it's very successful. There's a lot of positive things about it. But I'm wondering, have there been challenges or struggles that you could talk about? And how have you overcome those? How, I mean, are you still facing certain challenges that you haven't been able to overcome? 
And I mean, what you're talking about obviously are successes, but there must be things that you struggled with or failures or things that you worked at to overcome and maybe have not yet overcome. That's really a great question. Uh, so I'm glad you asked it. The biggest challenge we face is funding, uh, always. So there's always funding being cut. We're always having to search for new funding to replace funding, uh, et cetera. Um, about 85% of our $2.5 million budget that I mentioned is from the state. So we're very thankful to the state to provide that, you know, roughly 85%, but there are always cuts being made at the state level. And so then our funding gets cut. Um, the other thing that we rely on is donations. So every year we have an annual uh, letter that gets sent out asking for donations. Um, and, you know, over the years we have found it more and more challenging actually because people are doing a lot of online fundraising. And so we're in a lot of competition. In the past, you know, it used to be we'd get large donations, many donations, and it's really those have dwindled um, as, you know, fundraising has become an online thing and people are donating to lots of different organizations. So instead of giving us a large donation, they may split their donation up over multiple different places. Um, the most important thing is networking. So networking within the corporate world, uh, which can be very challenging, that's, you know, networking with businesses so that people will become donors. Um, and of course, you know, we, pe people who really have a heart for deaf people and care about what's happening uh, to the people that we're supporting. Um, and, you know, being deaf, that, that's an invisible disability, right? So a lot of people have never met a deaf person in their entire life. They don't know about deaf people. They don't know about the things that we deal with. And so a lot of it is education with people who are not familiar. Um, it's also very challenging to justify large uh, pots of money, you know, that you, that we're trying to access um, and, and writing up proposals for those and being convincing. Um, we, we need, you know, money to be able to serve thousands of, you know, about, we need to be able to serve all the people that we have. It's a smaller number of people, the population that we're talking about. Um, one way to justify the, co the cost is to say, here's the cost of communication access, because that is a big part of the cost. So when we're providing services to each individual person, there's a lot of communication access costs associated with that. And so we need to be able to justify it when we write proposals. We have been very successful uh, in doing that. I'll knock on wood as I'm saying that. But partnering has really been the key to that. Some services we can't provide and another entity can provide. So we partner with them instead of recreating what they're already doing. Uh, we try to provide support to that entity, another organization or agency. And we also, maybe it's an agency or an organization for hearing people, not spe specifically for deaf people, but they're providing something deaf people could benefit from. So we educate them on how to work with deaf and hard of hearing people. Um, so that we can partner. I would say another, another challenge is that uh, is related to staff. So we have about um, 25 staff. Uh, I'm laughing at uh, the, the way the interpreter signed 25 differently than me. Yes, 25. And there is a lot of changeover. So we need to fill positions frequently. Uh, we're a nonprofit organization. Um, you know, we're not dealing with a huge, you know, huge amounts of money. It's, it can be a challenge sometimes. So we, we need to try to get the correct staff and get positions filled. And that's an ongoing thing. Of course, COVID recently, everything has changed um, since, you know, the spring. We've been, we've been fortunate to be able to provide remote services. Um, and so we are open two days a week for appointment only. And that's, um, you know, in, in many of our locations, people can make an appointment to, if they need to be seen in person for, for a particular reason. Um, sometimes people don't have the technology that they need. And so we try to uh, get resources and provide those to people as we can. 
and also training and education on how to use the technology. So first the staff needs to be trained. And then once they know how to use Zoom and uh, you know on the particular technology, then they can train uh, the deaf and hard of hearing folks who receive services how to do that. Um, and then the services can be provided remotely, but we need to be able to do it safely, which, which we have fortunately been able to do so far. Um, so I was trying to think of uh, other challenges. Yes, Nancy. Um, Sharon, let's say that someone want, sees an advertisement for Deaf Inc. and it says that there's going to be a parent support group. Um, do they have to be sponsored by an agency or can they come to you directly to join that? Okay, so for independent living services, you can walk in basically. Uh, we have a frog or walk-in system so with COVID, of course, that's not in place. You have to call and make an appointment. You can't actually walk in and then it's provided remotely, but it is open to anyone who does that. For deaf blind, that works differently. Um, they need to be referred for, from the Massachusetts uh, Commission uh, on the Blind. So MCB needs to make a referral to say the person is legally blind. You know, they need to provide documentation. Uh, a report, et cetera. They do that on their own and then they make the referral to us uh, to be able to provide those services. If a deaf blind person wants services uh, from us, um, we would say, okay, you need to connect with MCB and we would you know, give them the information in order to do that. And then we do try to follow up, make sure that it's happening and that they were able to get access. And then, then we're able to work with the person. They're really um, it, we're open otherwise though, yes. Thank you. Sure, and I, I just wanted to add um, something about the board. The key thing there is that in the bylaws, it says we need to have 51% at least, minimum 51% of the board uh, is required to be deaf, deaf blind, uh, hard of hearing or have hearing loss. So that is also to be able to vote. So the 51% of the, of, of the board has to be, that, that's present, has to be deaf, hard of hearing, uh, or have hearing loss or deaf blind uh, to be able to vote. So that's the rules that we follow. We were sure to put that into our bylaws because Deaf Inc. is run by deaf, deaf blind, deaf hard, uh, hard of hearing people and also people with hearing loss. So that's that was really key to us to have that in the bylaws. The board is very, very involved in uh, governing the agency and the oversight uh, of the agency. And it's challenging to find board members as well. That is another challenge that we do have. We're thinking about opening it up possibly um, statewide and out of state potentially for people to join the board. Maybe that way we would be able to get um, you know, more people that would uh, fill those seats. I did see a few people show up. It looks like there were some questions. So I wanted to give an opportunity to answer those. I'm thrilled to hear what you're saying. I'm Jeannie and um, I work at the Royal Island School for the Deaf. So it's great hearing about Deaf Inc. And I just have to say, it would be great to have a Deaf Inc. here in Rhode Island. 15 years ago, I remember that I was working for VR and we could see the need for deafblind services, tactile interpreters, well, um, what you're calling DBCAN providers, like SSPs. Yeah, we call them DBCAN providers. Yes. So we were looking for that to have a you know group here. We struggled with it. And finally, we, we contacted and you couldn't do DBCAM providing out of state because it's connected to Massachusetts. So you could not provide it to here. We thought about incorporating something like that here. And as you said, that the key to the success is the community involvement and partnering with other organizations that are working with deaf people. Money is a huge thing. 
So those three, those are the three and, um, legislator. Yeah, right. and the legislation. For us, that has also been a key. We have to be have partnerships with our legislators. So there's four things that we need. And what I'm thinking is how can we start something like that? What would be the first step that we, the first few steps, let's say, that we could do? What would you recommend here in Rhode Island? Okay, so I think first you'd wanna think about what kind of services that you'd want to start with. Um, you know, what would those look like? So you have an idea of what you're, what you're building and then you would wanna be gathering data. How many deaf uh, and deaf blind people, if you're talking about deaf blind services specifically, how many deaf blind people are there in your state? Um, what are the challenges faced by the population that you're gonna serve um, and getting data about that? Um, and a deaf, in, in the case of serving deaf blind people, you really need a deaf blind person to always be there to be speaking for themselves. You, you, uh, they, they go to the state house. You don't go alone and speak for the deaf blind community. Um, you send them to um, speak with senators, to speak with representatives, um, committees on, for example, families uh, and children, the disability committees, different, different places that they can appear. Um, minority leaders, all sorts of things. The key people, identifying those key people um, and often we'll call to make an appointment and we'll sit down uh, with that person and it'll be a deaf blind person with a DBCAN provider uh, and one of us will join. And that way the deaf blind person is telling their own story and talking about what it is that's missing, what it is that's needed. And that gives that human piece. So the representative is seeing, oh, this is a person and they have needs and they're, you know, in the community. Um, sometimes the, one, one moment. Oftentimes there'll be someone there that will be taking notes from, from the meeting. You can actually meet with others as well. Sometimes you can meet with an aide. If you can't meet with the legislator directly, there are other people that you can meet, key people you can meet with and they'll take notes from the meeting and they'll pass it on to the legislators. So really you wanna begin making relationships, identify who are the key people, and then start making visits to the state house, making appointments with people, meeting with those folks and their representatives and trying to have deaf blind people telling their own stories um, because none of this happens overnight, of course, but it really does start with relationships. It takes time and there's really an investment that needs to be made. Uh, to get that started. So that those are the three things I would say. Get people involved. De, you know, if you're talking about deafblind services, get deafblind people involved. Start writing down, what do we want? What are we talking about here? What are the costs and data to justify the need? And then go and see people, go and talk to them. Thank you so much. That's great. Tim Singh. Obviously, I'm Tim Riker, and hi, Sharon. Um, you had mentioned the board being 51% deaf, deaf blind, late deaf, and hard of hearing. So Rhode Island is a very small state. It's not like Massachusetts. Right. You mentioned the Center for Living and Working, CLW, and they have partnered with a non-deaf disability organization. And I'm wondering if we could hear more about the pros and cons of a deaf standalone independent living service versus a deaf partnership working with cross disabilities. Because Rhode Island, I mean, right now, we would be, you know, a small group in a very large organization if we were the only deaf group. And I'm just thinking maybe to begin with the first step, Maybe that would be, I don't know if that would be, you know, if it's an issue because we have, you know, coronavirus and the pandemic right now, whether or not that would be a, a like a conservative first step or what? Well, I would say that I am, I strongly believe and advocate for deaf led uh, organizations. So over my years of experience, if, I hope I'm not gonna offend any hearing people here that are not deaf, but if 
the deaf organization is under a hearing organization, so a subset, it receive, the deaf programming always receives less attention. It may not be intentional neglect, it just might be that it is a smaller population. And so people are thinking about, well, we need to think about the largest programs. We need to pay attention to the numbers, sort of. So it becomes, even if it's not intentional, the deaf programs are not the priority. That seems to be, in general, my, my experience over many years is was what I've seen. Um, the Society for Deaf People in, in New York State, that was, uh, speaking a long time ago, uh, I was the, involved with them. The I worked there and it was deaf run. And then over the years, I think it was, it was established in 1911 by uh, a Jewish, a Jewish person and the group grew from there. Um, it was very successful until about, I think the nineties, they started to have a lot of funding problems and so they merged with a larger organization. It was a very large organization actually. And they were happy to take on, um, you know, the deaf organization. And the Society for, for Deaf People uh, at that time, they had a number of um, apartments uh, and they had residential services there. Uh, it was a support, support services program. Um, for deaf people, and it became it. It went ended up under this larger org hearing organization, and this is one example of what happens, you know, across the board in many many organizations. I followed, you know, kind of what was going on with with them um, because I had worked with them. I was very curious, and. I tried to find them at one point. I was looking for their website and I wanted to see what was going on, uh, if they were hiring deaf folks. And eventually that program actually just got smaller and smaller until it disappeared. And so it just sort of fell off the radar of this very large organization and it just became no more. And so that's just one example of where I really advocate for deaf run and focused organizations. Um, Maybe partnering with another organization may work. It may, maybe another deaf organization, perhaps. Um, but we stand alone, you know, partially for that reason. We want to run by deaf people and focus on deaf people um, and not get distracted by being part of a larger hearing organization. Um, our Deaf Sisters Survivors, it's a small organization, but they do a lot of advocacy. Um, they do, they connect with therapists, they do uh, advocacy within hospitals, all sorts of different things. And they're growing more and more, they're getting larger and larger, but that started as a very small organization. They do a lot of advocacy in Massachusetts. I have so many things, <laughs> but I'll save my, my breath <laughs> until later. I can, I can batter you with questions later. <laughs> of course, of course. Any other questions? Yes, I did want to say hi again. Ernest, um, thank you so much what you're speaking about. And I do understand your point about key to having community involvement and legislative awareness. And I want you to know that in Rhode Island, we've worked with Pam Zellner here. She's one of our staff. And she has set up a legislators week, a legislative week where I mean, we can't now because of COVID, we can't go into the state house, but we try to set up a Zoom time where we can talk to them about our issues. And we're trying to figure out how we could get the community more involved and how to build some of those bridges between the legislators and the community, because you're saying it's key that the community self-advocate and communicate directly to the legislators. And I think that's wonderful. And I'm just trying to figure out how, if you have any tips or thoughts about what we could do for our legislators week, it might be in March or April that it's coming up and we're seeing if we could possibly get the community involved in some kind of a town hall forum or workshop that we could do beforehand about self-advocacy and then they could contact their legislators directly to lobby. And, you know, 
you said, people go to the state house, they speak for themselves at these different committees. And I just, I'm wondering if you could give us some direction that would make our legislative week work really well. Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, you know, legislators are very, very important. Uh, it's so important to meet with them. You know, during coronavirus, I mean, it's just an extra challenge. And that's something that we've been thinking about as well. Um, in the spring, we it's the legislative season. So that's really where we advocate for funding and all of that. So yeah, you're talking about March, April. Again, we're going to be working at that time as well. Um, what we've done in the past, so if we put COVID aside, uh, the Mass Commission for the Deaf has an annual Deaf and Hard of Hearing Awareness Day at the State House. That's something that's annual. A lot of people attend that. It's very well attended. The community um, contacts their own legislators, you know, based on where they live, and then invites them to go to this event at the State House, the Deaf and Hard of Hearing Awareness Day. So they each reach out to their um, their own legislators uh, and, and hope to get them there. Many legislators have an office there. So it's very easy for them to just come down to the first floor uh, and attend that event. The event is a, it's, we start with awards and recognition of legislators to thank them for their support. So that's kind of a, you know, uh, a little nice thing that we do for legislators to make them feel good about the work that they're doing with us. And then we share success stories of what's the work that's been done and legislators can hear, oh, okay, here's what's going on. Um, and it's, you know, one, two hours. And then uh, in the afternoon, people, the community goes and visits legislators in their offices small groups or one or two people and they go with interpreters. Interpreters are provided so that the community members can then go in and say to their legislator, this service is really important to me and we don't have it or we need to be improved or there's no funding for this or it's not accessible, etc. And so people tell their own personal stories at those. And these are open door, this is sort of an open door afternoon where they can go and visit legislators. Um, the idea is to pull everyone to the state house where the legislators already are. Um, if you already have the legislators there, you pull the community there. That's one way to do it um, because it's kind of, it's easy. It's easy for the legislators to be involved. Another possibility, and again, you know, this year is going to be different for everyone, but one possibility is to send letters. Um, we've had the deaf community, you know, deaf community members come to Deaf Inc and sit down and talk about what do you want to say and actually we take video of them expressing themselves um, using sign and then they're translated into letters that are then sent to the legislators but they actually we actually can send a video of the signing uh, and then have it uh, interpreted into English so that the legislators actually get to see rather the community member telling their story uh, and access it through an interpretation rather than a faceless letter. So that's been something that's been successful. I wanted to give the interpreter time to catch up. Um, something else uh, that can be done, maybe a legislative Zoom breakfast uh, might work on Zoom, I'm not sure. Uh, legislators typically come if we invite them to come to, you know, if you say we're inviting you to join this Zoom event and there will be deaf blind people here telling their stories and it's all interpreted and accessible. So having some sort of event, you know, you'd have to, of course, do it on Zoom for this year, but that's one option. Thank you so much. That really, that, that, that really answers my question. Absolutely. Are there, are there other questions? I have a question. Um, I can get myself going here. Um, I was interested in uh, the um, online ASL instruction. Is uh, that all, is all, all that information on your website? Let me ask you that first. 
Oh, yes, it is. Yes. Okay. All right. Yeah, I'm not going to. information is on the website at Deaf Inc. It's D-E-A-F-I-N-C online, O-N-L-I-N-G dot org. So okay, all the information is there. And we offer classes at different levels. We have like level one to four or five. So, and we use, the technique we use is called True Way ASL. It's a curriculum to teach ASL. I've heard of it. And we might have, six to 15 and sometimes as high as 20 people in the Zoom. It's offered on Tuesdays, Wednesdays, and Thursdays at the different levels. There is a fee. They charge you, I'm trying to think, $250, I believe. And it's 10 weeks of classes, two hours a night for 10 weeks. And we also offer, right now we're actually offering a Japanese sign language class. We had offered a Russian sign language class. And because of that, offering that, we started to realize that there were people who were joining that class from South America, from other parts of the world. People from Italy, I mean, they were joining it because they were interested in learning Russian sign and it was great. Because of Zoom, I mean, it actually, reduces the restrictions. People can join from anywhere in the world. Okay, great, thank you. I will look on your website. I don't want to ask questions that I can um, find the answers to there. No problem at all. And feel free to contact us with any questions. You can always write us an email. I will, thank you. Do we have any other questions for Sharon? Um, I found much of this so helpful to just process. Our needs are pretty basic um, as well as uh, comprehensive. So it, it will be a large responsibility to figure out what the critical needs are to begin with and how we could possibly get those off the ground. Um, but knowing your experiences is very helpful. It's got my brain really actively going. Any other questions or thoughts? comments on um, a Deaf Inc. type organization for us? No thoughts? Sharon, I just want to thank you so much. And um, if you think of anything else that you feel would be critical for us to know, I would love for you to go ahead and send it on to us. Um, but in the interim, I want to thank you with my whole heart for making time for us. I know how busy you are. Oh, <laughs> for sure. And thank you for inviting me. I really enjoy sharing this kind of information with you. And I wish you all the best of luck. Don't give up. Keep going. Get the community involved. Yeah, our community needs it. And thank someday... You. You'll, you'll set up something. Something will happen. Thank you so much. Very good. Take care all. Thank you. And it was nice to meet everyone. And everyone turn on your cameras, please, so Sharon can see us one last time and we could say goodbye. Keep safe, everybody. You Keep too. Keep healthy. <laughs> Oh, my pleasure. You're welcome. Oh, yes. Take care. Bye-bye. After listening to her. Hi, Tim. Hi, yes. Um, what I'd like to know is, what's our next step? You know, now we have this, this immense information, right? I'm wondering... Would it make sense to, you know, obviously there's a need. Obviously there's a need in Rhode Island. Is this the right time? You know, would be one question. What are the steps uh, that we would start with? You know, uh, uh, what would be the, the thinking about a plan? Obviously it's not something that's going to happen overnight. It may be a couple of years where, where we're working until we get to the place that, that we really want to be. So I'm just kind of curious about thoughts about, about that. 
Does anyone want to jump in um, before I jump in? <laughs> well, one thing that I really listened carefully in the beginning was they started small. They chose independent living services that were really critical and that's where they began. Um, I can see us um, doing that. I can see us moving towards some um, small scale, low hanging fruit um, and, um, and then growing as they did over time. But I was also curious that they created partnerships as they needed to. So they partnered with MRC, they partnered with MCB, the Commission for the Blind, they partnered with DCYF. Um, they weren't afraid to reach out and say, look, you're already providing these things, but you're not doing it well to deaf people. Let us do it well for the community that we serve. And I think that makes a lot of sense that you look for things that are already happening. I'm going to give you an example. I have a student um, who was homeless and um, has a small family and DCYF needed to take care of her. Um, they are learning a lot about taking care of her through the VOCA group at Tri-County, the victims um, advocacy group. They've been amazing. Uh, they are working with us to service this particular young deaf family. They are working now soon with OSIL. They, um, once they realized that there were people in the community who had more information about servicing this young family appropriately than they did, they were more than happy to redirect funding to get this going. I think that's just one example of, um, of the way that we could begin to look at basic needs and get started by partnering with agencies that are already doing this, but they have no idea how to do it well um, for persons who are deaf or deaf blind. So I don't know what those items would be that we would start with. That would be for um, uh, a board to begin to think about, but maybe the first step would be to create a board that would begin to think about um, planning, becoming a 5013C. I don't know, I'm throwing that out there. Um, maybe you have more information about that than I do, but you gotta start somewhere, right? Jeannie? So um, is it okay for me to comment? Just because I'm visiting, I just wanted to make sure that was- Yes, of course. So OSIL is already providing independent living services. So, you know, I'm wondering, you know, maybe there's funding available that could be used. Like if something were established as like you're talking about to provide independent living services, wouldn't that be similar to what OSIL is already providing? And then how would that be different? Um, would it be like say shared funding from the state? Like each would get uh, part of that money. So thinking like a legislator, they're thinking, well, we're already funding also to provide these independent living services. Um, you know, that's something I think they would like to know well, how that would, you know, work. The other thing is, um, you know, I wonder about emergency services. You know, if somebody becomes homeless, um, you know, suddenly something comes up, you know, would there only be office hours or would there be some sort of on-call system uh, something 24 seven, you know, I'm just kind of throwing out all the things that are randomly kind of populating my mind at the moment uh, about all of this. One of the things that we or the board, whoever gets this started would have to think about is, is this going to be an educational organization or is it going to be a social service organization or is it going to be an advocacy organization? Um, maybe eventually it would be all three, but you can't start spreading yourself that thin. You'd have to really make a decision. What are the first steps of this organization going to look like? Um, my experience in setting up new programs, you're usually a lot more successful when you seek funding if you have a sharp focus in one area. You can always spread it later and grow, but if your focus is too diverse, you don't get money usually. 
Um, and so I, I really um, suggest that that would be the first step. Whatever group takes this on, they would need to really determine what kind of an organization are we going to be initially. Um, in terms of Jeannie's question, I would not want to take away from OSIL. We already have OSIL in place, but there are things OSIL does not offer. And we could certainly, if we had a, a Deaf Inc. type organization, we could work with OSIL to help um, identify needs that maybe they're not seeing that we are seeing. Um, and again, that's another kind of partnership that would be important. The VOCA group, the Victims Advocacy Group, they are partnered under um, the Tri-County Organization and that has allowed them a lot of freedom. Now I know that's a hearing organization, but they've already got their office systems in place, secretaries, phone systems, that made it easier for the victims advocate group to really um, take off. So there are lots of different ways to look at it. We already have pieces in Rhode Island. How do we get them to work together? Maybe something like a Deaf Inc. could be the connecting link. I'm throwing that out there. I wish I could see your faces. This is a very awkward way to conduct business. Does anybody have any thoughts? Hi, Tim. Thank you. Yeah, I'm, you know, I'm thinking a lot about this. You know, Sharon mentioned it's important to have community involvement, you know, good leadership and know how to, uh, you know, connect with the right legislators and all that. I'm just thinking about Rhode Island and how Rhode Island uh, functions and maybe some leadership training, um, get some new people involved who maybe don't have much experience, haven't been involved, but do have something to bring um, to the table. And maybe those could be come people who visit legislators um, so that there are a lot of different people that are able to do that. Because I feel like there are so many different gaps in Rhode Island. Um, I've, I've always thought that leadership training maybe was something that could inspire people, you know, deaf and hard of hearing and deaf blind people in Rhode Island to take action and to, um, you know, try to start building those relationships. Anyone else have some thoughts? Let me get my camera on again. Is anyone else, what's brewing up there? Hi, Jeannie. What about the data collection? Um, asking the community for, um, or, you know, in general, like, are you satisfied with the services that are available or what are the gaps in services? Asking the community uh, to say, you know, are you willing to become involved with advocacy? And then, you know, that data collection piece that Sharon talked about, something to think about, maybe can start there with uh, being able to identify the critical needs based on that. So your collection, data collection point, I mean, we actually have not done data collection for deaf and hard of hearing people. And we would like to develop, like HTSP has already done a survey for deaf people related specifically to healthcare, you know, related to their goals. And I think they had a hundred surveys re returned. They were hoping for 200, but they got a hundred or 130 or something. And then Gallaudet University Regional um, was able to work on, you know, collating that kind of information, analyzing it. So for the healthcare committee, they had been in touch with a state agency in Rhode Island that was focused on data collection. And they were willing to do more collection for us, which was excellent because we weren't aware that they actually had a statewide organization that focused on that. So yesterday, the healthcare committee heard about that and we explained 
what you know we're doing that we don't have that kind of information with deaf and hard of hearing people and they were like well, what they wanted to know is what the focus areas were for deaf and hard of hearing people and we're not sure at this point what are the issues that are facing most deaf people is it homelessness is it immigration is it food scarcity is it unemployment we need to be able to identify that for data collection that would be important for us and then we could give that to the legislature and they could that would help them to be able to you know um, earmark different funding amounts so i think the key for us the big issue is for the legislators to get the support that we need for the needs that we have and so they're all connected all these things are connected together because if we had the data collection and now we found out the state agency can do that, we could be in touch with them to do some analyzing because we don't actually have that expertise. We don't know how to do that, but they have people who are dedicated to that and they could do that. You know, we could write a proposal to them. Once it's analyzed, we would have that information and we could use that with the community. I think that would be a good start. So I hope that answers your question because we just found out that new information and I'm excited about it. Any other thoughts? Again, if you look at the order she recommended it, what do you want to provide? So what do you, what do you wanna be first? then collect data on needs in that area, and then begin to get the consumers and the community excited about it and involved. So those were, that was the process that she recommended. It made a lot of sense to me, having started other organizations. Um, and again, I think it, we have, whoever takes this on has to determine what is it that we want to serve. And maybe it starts with a survey to find out what are the services that this new small group could begin to provide. But I, I has it, it's not necessarily going to be a state organization. It's going to be its own organization. So you can't rely only on legislators or on state agencies. It's going to need to be its own fundraising arm and its own dedicated set of bylaws Otherwise, other people are going to run it and not deaf consumers. And we want it to be run and led by deaf people, right? So um, I think we want to be really careful that we have an organization and then we bring people on board uh, as opposed to starting with legislators and other organizations that end up owning it. Does that make sense to anybody? Am I out in left field? I'm just curious what you're thinking and I can't see your faces, so. <laughs> yeah, Tim is saying yes, he agrees. So, so I think I would like to propose that the agenda for our next meeting um, be that we really think about how are we going to get this off the ground? How are we going to start it? Do we want to do this, first of all? Do we want this to be an outgrowth of this education subcommittee? Do we want to be the catalyst or jumpstart the, um, the beginnings of this new organization? And, uh, and where do we wanna begin? What do we think the, what service do we want to provide that's doable and begins to build our credibility first and foremost? These are all things to think about. Um, before the next meeting, unless there's some other agenda items that people want to uh, bring forward. Okay, um, hearing none. Oh, there's Tim, great. Yeah, I think it's it's easy to be camera shy. Sometimes people don't want to put on their camera and make a comment. Um, in terms of the agenda, maybe at the next meeting, um, we should do more collection of information, get different perspectives, um, maybe invite someone else 
um, from a different organization that has maybe different experience um, to get input from them, or we could go a different direction and have a discussion about what we think is needed. Um, are we collecting more information or are we at the stage where we wanna go forward with trying to figure out uh, where the critical needs are? Like, where are we kind of in the process, I guess? Do we wanna make a decision about where we are in that uh, moving forward or staying in this information gathering? Thanks, Tim. I totally agree. We have to decide, are we in a information gathering stage as opposed to data gathering? Or are we, um, do we still, um, or are we, do we think we know, we want to listen to each other and each other's perspectives? Who would we bring? Can you think of another agency that, um, that serves deaf and hard of hearing individuals that might have something to offer us? I'm quite amazed at how many times I have to lean on the victim's advocate people. Uh, they are doing a lot of work that's way beyond what they originally thought they were going to do because the advocacy needs are so um, tremendous. I don't know what they could offer us. I think they were started by a grant. Is that right? Hi, Leela. You're muted, dear. Okay. Sorry. I'm just wondering if it makes sense to the next meeting talk about um, what our own thoughts are of where we should zone in on for this organization and then bring somebody in to like help kind of guide us because um, I don't know. That's just my thoughts because I feel like we did have like a big meeting where we threw out a lot of ideas and now we have more information and I'm just wondering maybe kind of regroup before we bring somebody on so that we don't get too all over the map. Mm -hmm. It's just a thought. Mm -hmm. Good thought. So Leela, that was a good thought. Do we want to spend some time just talking among ourselves and think and really having everybody weigh in on where, where they're feeling about this? You are correct. We started with listing basic needs in the state and we discovered that many of them would fall under the purview of a small community agency like this. Um, or do we want it to be a resource center as opposed to an agency? There's a lot of things to talk about. Um, how do people feel about that? Instead of inviting another speaker, would you prefer to spend a meeting just mulling this over together? It means you're going to have to talk, though. <laughs> okay, Tim is saying yes. Anybody else agreed with that? If you don't want to turn on your screen, you can use your reaction button on the bottom. When you look at your reaction button, you've got claps and hearts and thumbs up. I haven't heard from anybody but Tim. What would we like to do at the next meeting? Okay, Paul is saying yes. Jen is saying yes. All right, at the next meeting, we will spend some time, having thought about it for um, a couple of months, we will spend some time mulling over ourselves. And if you do hear of other groups in the community who've done some good work, don't be shy. Go ahead and talk to them. See if you can get information for them. Or if you know of people who are using Deaf Inc. services, don't be shy. Talk to them about, you know, what is it about Deaf Inc. that they cherish the most? We may learn something from their consumers that is very helpful. Okay. Um, we did not, um, we did not take a vote to uh, pass, to accept the minutes. Could I have a motion to accept the minutes before we close out and then a second? Leela, are you making a motion to accept the minutes? Yes. Okay, and Tim, are you seconding? Thank you. I'll second, yes. 
All right, so the minutes have been read, approved, and seconded. And um, if there's no objection to that, we will um, we'll proceed. Tim, did you have anything you wanted to add before we close out? No, I just uh, opened up the screen ready to say bye, that's all. <laughs> all right, everybody, please open your screen so we can see your happy faces. I wish you all a very happy new year. And, um, and we will meet again. Uh, we usually meet every three months. So this is January. So we're talking about February, April. Is that an agreement to everybody or do you wanna meet in March? March, okay, I, I see two people saying March. Um, we will go with um, the third Thursday in March, which seems to be what we've been working on. Okay with everybody? And that is, I'll give you the date, just so you can check your calendars. The 18th. 18th at four o'clock, is that still work for people, four o'clock? Okay, I see lots of thumbs up. Thank you everyone and um, stay healthy. Bye.